Most chemicals give a pretty consistent color, regardless of the solvent that they're dissolved in. There are some chemicals though, which are sylvatochromic, meaning that their color changes drastically with different solvents. So instead, we can get something that looks like this. This was a photo that I found on Wikipedia, and it shows the color range of a chemical called MOED, or Brooker's Merocyanine. In general, I was really interested by this whole concept of sulfatochromism, and I wanted to try it out. As with most of my projects, I planned to make it myself, but just out of curiosity, I looked online to see how much it would cost. The only places that I found selling it were Fisher and Alpha, and both were insanely expensive. Alpha was a bit better than Fisher, but it was still almost $500 a gram. And oddly enough, Sigma Alderich didn't even sell it at all. This all really didn't matter though, because as I said before, I planned to make it myself. I generally just find it a lot more fun to make the product instead of buying it, but now I also had a financial incentive to do it, and I was really curious to see how much cheaper I could make it for. I looked online for how to make it, and I was only really able to find one procedure. It unfortunately required a few chemicals that I didn't have on hand, but they were all available from Sigma. Sigma is generally pretty overpriced when it comes to chemicals, but in this case I didn't really mind paying for it because in the end I was going to be saving a lot of money. So what I ended up picking up was iodomethane, 4-methylpyridine, and 4-hydroxybenzaldehyde. The other ingredients that I still needed was 100% isopropanol and ethanol, piperidine, and potassium hydroxide. I got the isopropanol from a local dental supply company and I actually made the ethanol myself by fermenting sugar, distilling it, and then drying it. Piperidine's unfortunately a controlled substance, so I didn't really want to buy it or to use it in this prep. I instead switched it out for triethylamine, which I hoped would work just as well. Triethylamine's relatively easy to find online, and I've bought it before, but this bottle in particular was sent to me by a fan a long time ago. And the last ingredient was potassium hydroxide, which was pretty easy to find online. To get started, I added 20 ml of cold and dry isopropanol to a flask. Then I turned on the stirring and added 19.4 ml of the 4-methylpyridine. It was all quickly mixed together, and I moved on to setting up an ice bath. I let the solution chill here for about 5 or 10 minutes, and then I started to slowly add the iodomethane. In total, I added about 12.5 mils, and I did it over the course of around 4 or 5 minutes. With each addition, it didn't really look like much was happening, but it was slowly getting more and more yellow. What was happening here was a relatively slow reaction between the 4-methylpyridine and the iodomethane. The major product of this is 1,4-dimethylpyridinium iodide, which has a slight yellow color. The reason I did this in an ice bath and added the iodomethane slowly was just to keep things under control. When the iodomethane is added, it can generate some heat, and if this was all done at room temperature, it might have heated things up a bit too much. The original procedure just said to pre-chill all the reagents, but I found it easier to instead just use an ice bath. After everything had been added, I let it stir for another 5 or 10 minutes, and then I took away the ice bath. At this point, the reaction had progressed a decent amount, but to get it to completion, I was going to have to heat it. To do this, I needed to set up a reflux, but it took me a while to get everything together. And in the meantime, the reaction kept chugging along, even though it was still kind of slow. I unfortunately missed it and wasn't able to film it, but there was eventually a point at which so much pyridinium iodide was made that it started to separate out. This wasn't really an issue though, because it was going to happen anyway. So I lowered the flask onto the heating mantle, and I turned on the stirring and heating. I also of course plugged in my water recirculator to get the water going through my condenser. I let it warm up and it eventually got to a boil, but it was way too vigorous so I turned down the heating. I adjusted it until the reflux rate was about a drop a second, and then I kept it like this for the next 2 hours. The reaction that was happening here was exactly the same as what was happening before, I was just using heat to push it to completion. At around the hour mark, it looked like it was really getting jammed up with a lot of solid, so I took out the condenser and tried to break it apart. It kind of worked and it gave me a more uniform slush, but I don't really think that this was that necessary to do. In any case, I boiled it for another hour and then I took away the heating mantle. As it cooled down, the yellow color slowly faded and by the time that it was room temperature, it was mostly white. I broke it up as best I could with a glass rod, and then I transferred it all to a filter funnel. 
It really didn't look like there was much or any solvent left over, but it was all still there and it was just stuck to the solid. So when it was all added, I turned on my vacuum pump and you can see that quite a bit of liquid was pulled out. I let the pump run for a few minutes to dry it up as much as possible. Then I turned it off and I added a small amount of ice cold 95% ethanol. I swirled it around to dissolve any impurities or unreacted starting material and then I turned on the vacuum pump again. All the ethanol was quickly pulled away and I left the pump on for another 5 or 10 minutes just to dry it up as much as possible. At this point the product was still crude so to clean it up I had to recrystallize it. This was quite easy to do and I just had to dissolve it in a minimal amount of boiling 95% ethanol. So I added it to a beaker, poured in a small amount of the ethanol, and turned on the heating. With most recrystallizations, you have to be pretty careful with the amount of solvent that's used because if you use too much, you'll lose a bunch of your product. In this case though, the solubility of the pyridinium iodide in cold ethanol is so low that I don't think it really matters too much. Anyway, it eventually got to a boil and everything had dissolved, so I took it off the hot plate. I also put a watch glass on top to prevent the ethanol from evaporating. Then I took out the stir bar and I waited for it to cool to room temperature. I let it sit for about an hour and at this point it was only warm to the touch but no crystals had formed. I initially thought that maybe I used way too much solvent but I thought it was more likely that it was just a super saturated solution. So I dipped in a glass rod that still had some crude crystals of the pyridinium iodide on it. This provided nucleation sites for the pyridinium iodide in solution to build on and it all started crystallizing out. When it looked like it was more or less done, I put it in the freezer to drop the solubility even more. I left it in there for a few hours and then I filtered it off. Like before, I turned on the vacuum pump and I pulled away as much of the solvent as possible. Then I washed the beaker and the crystals with a small amount of ice cold ethanol. I left the pump on for about 20 minutes, but the crystals were still quite wet. So to get it as dry as possible, I transferred it back to a beaker and I put it in a vacuum desiccator. I filled the bottom of the desiccator with calcium chloride, which can form a complex with both water and ethanol and should speed up the process. I pulled nearly a full vacuum on it, closed the valve at the top, and I let it sit for about a day or so. Then I took it out and this time, it was definitely a lot drier. My final yield was 33 grams, which was a percent yield of about 70%. Okay, so with this precursor now made, I could move on to building up to the actual MOED. And to do this, I started by adding 14.5 grams of freshly recrystallized 4-hydroxybenzaldehyde. Then on top of this, I dumped in 28.4 grams of the 1,4-dimethylpyridinium iodide that I had just made. The reason I used 28.4 and not the full 33 that I made was just because that's what the procedure called for. When they made the pyridinium iodide, they got 28.4 grams, so that's what they just used in the next step. In theory, I could have just scaled everything up to the full 33, but I decided to follow it with the 28.4 and to save the difference. I figured that maybe in the future it could be useful for something else, so it was worth keeping some around. Anyway, after adding both these chemicals, I then poured in 150 ml of dry ethanol. I let it stir for about 10 minutes, but not everything dissolved, so I moved on to adding the triethylamine. The moment it was added, it immediately turned yellow, and it also seemed to slowly clear up a bit. Just like the other reaction, to get it really going I had to heat it, so I set it up for a reflux. As it warmed up, the rest of the undissolved stuff eventually disappeared and the color slowly changed. This time lapse here was taken over the course of about 20 minutes. So what should be going on here is a base catalyzed reaction between the pyridinium iodide and the 4-hydroxybenzaldehyde. This leads to the formation of this intermediate molecule which isn't quite MOED and there's still one final step that I need to do. Anyway, this reaction had to be refluxed for 24 hours, but after around the hour mark, it visually didn't change very much. This was what it looked like about 18 hours in, and it was just a bit darker. When it got to the 24 hour mark, I took away the heating mantle and I let it cool overnight. And when it came back in the morning, I saw that a whole bunch of red solid had formed. I scraped it all off the sides, and then I dumped it into my vacuum filter. Then I washed the flask with a small amount of ice cold ethanol and I added it to the filter. 
I used a glass rod to mix it around a bit and to wash the powder, and then I pulled everything through. Before the washing, it was full of impurities, so it was just this brownish black powder, but afterwards, it was this really nice red. It still looked like there was a bit of brownish black stuff left, so I washed everything with a bit more of the ethanol. I left the vacuum on for about 20 minutes to dry it up, and then I broke it up into a powder. I dumped it all out onto a watch glass, and I was honestly really impressed with how rich and nice the color was. What didn't impress me though was the yield, and I only had 9.25 grams here. This was a terrible percent yield of about 22%, when I think it should have been closer to 80 or 90. In my mind, this was almost definitely because I used the triethylamine. I expected the reaction to be hindered a bit, but I really didn't think it would be this bad. In the future, if I ever have to do this reaction again, I'll definitely try using a secondary amine like pyrrolidine instead, which is structurally very close to piperidine. It's also totally legal, and relatively cheap from Sigma. I really should have just ordered it from the beginning, but it's like, whatever. I still managed to make way more product than I needed, and I also learned something in the end, so this mistake really didn't bother me that much. In any case, this still wasn't the final MOED, and I had one last step to do. All the nice red powder was dumped into a beaker, and I added a thermometer. Then I started adding 500 ml of a dilute potassium hydroxide solution. The procedure called for 700, but because my yield was significantly lower, I didn't think I needed to use that much. I honestly have no idea why I tried going with a black background here, because after adding just a small amount, I realized the contrast was going to be horrible. So I quickly swapped it out for a white one, and continued the addition. I brought it up to about the 500ml mark, and then I turned on the hot plate. The goal was to heat it, but not to the boiling point, so I brought it up to around 80C. As it warmed up, a lot of the solids started dissolving, but the most interesting part was the surface of the mixture. It had a really interesting pattern to it, and I probably stared at it for a little bit too long. Almost all the solid eventually dissolved, and it had this really dark solution. When I shot a light through it though, I could still see that there was some solid floating around. I let it go for another 5 minutes or so, but the solid was still there. So I just ended up adding about 100 more mils of the potassium hydroxide solution. In hindsight though, this probably wasn't necessary, and I should have just let it react for a little bit longer. So, speaking of the reaction, what was going on here was an elimination, where a double bond was forming, and the OH hydroxyl group was getting kicked out. And this led to the formation of the final MOED. When everything had dissolved, I started my timer, and I heated it for 30 minutes. Then I took it off the hot plate, removed the stir bar and the thermometer, and I let it cool overnight. When I came back the next day, there were some really nice crystals that had formed at the bottom, and I was kind of sad that I didn't do a time lapse. To separate them off, I just used my vacuum filter again. After the initial liquid had all been pulled through, I washed the beaker and the crystals with some ice cold water. I left the pump on for several minutes to get rid of as much water as possible, and then I let it dry for about a day or so. The final dry result was a bunch of red, flaky crystals. My yield was kind of terrible though, and I only got 5.8 grams. Compared to the amount of precursor that I put into the dehydration reaction though, the yield was close to 100%. The major loss in this entire prep really came down to my use of triethylamine and my miserable 22% yield in the previous step. However, even with my mistake and my bad yield, it was still way cheaper than buying it. This is just a rough estimate of what it cost me for each component. So, strictly in materials, it cost me about $13.60 to make 1 gram of MOED. If I'd bought the pyrrolidine though, and if it worked just as well as the piperidine, I could have gotten up to 22 grams. And in that hypothetical case, I might have been able to make it for about $3.80 a gram. So in the worst case like I got here, it would still be 45 times cheaper than the lowest price that I could find online. And in the best case, if I got the full 22 grams, it could be up to 162 times cheaper. Considering how straightforward and easy it is to make it, I feel like buying it makes absolutely no sense. If you guys know of any cheaper and actually reasonable sources though, please let me know. Okay, now to test what we actually came here for, and to see if it's sulvatochromic.
To do this, I lined up eight small vials, filled each with about 10 milligrams of MOED, and started adding solvents. The first was water, then it was methanol, ethanol, acetic acid, isopropanol, DMSO, acetone, and finally DCM. With all the solvents added, I then tried stirring them to dissolve as much as possible. It worked decently well for the first five, but the last few were a bit problematic. For some reason, when I stirred the DMSO, the purple would disappear. I'm not exactly sure why this happened, but eventually it did end up staying purple. The MOED was barely soluble in the acetone, and even less so in the DCM. The stirring really didn't seem like it was going to work, so instead I just capped all the vials and shook them. I occasionally shook them over the course of the day, and I was eventually left with this nice spectrum of colors. What was also interesting was that the fluorescence changed as well, and this was what it looked like under a UV light. The question now though, is why does the color change? Well, the common explanation for savatochromism comes down to the polarity of the solvent. I don't want to get into too much detail about polarity, but in general, it has to do with how the electrons are distributed around the molecule. This distribution is determined by the geometry and the chemical makeup of the molecule, and it's different for each one. When it's uneven and asymmetrical like with water, we get areas with high concentrations of electrons and other areas with a relatively low concentration. This causes there to be a partial negative over the oxygen and a partial positive over the hydrogens, and the molecule is said to be polar. However, in other cases, like with pentane, the electrons are spread out very evenly, and there's little to no charge separation. Molecules like this are said to be nonpolar. So when it comes to solvents, polarity is important because it gives us an idea of what it should be able to dissolve. In general, polar solvents like to dissolve polar molecules, and the nonpolar solvents prefer the nonpolar ones. Anyway, with that being said, why does polarity affect the color of the MOED? From what I found, it seems like the exact details are quite complicated, but the general idea of it is relatively simple. MOED exists as an equilibrium between two molecules, which I'll just refer to as A and B. In solution, the A form has a yellow color, and the B is closer to blue or violet. Both forms exist at any given time, and the color that the solution takes on is due to a balance of the two. Different solvents will favor one over the other, and therefore cause the color to change. In general, the more polar a solvent is, the more it'll favor the charged A form. So this would be why in highly polar solvents like water, we get an orangey-yellow color. However, as we move across the solvents and things get less and less polar, the amount of the B form increases. This causes the color to change, and we eventually get to a very nice violet or blue color. At first glance, this seems like a decent explanation, but there's one major problem with it. It doesn't explain the two major anomalies here, which are the acetic acid and the DMSO. Acetic acid is definitely less polar than water, but color-wise, it looks like it should go before it. The DMSO seems to be placed quite well, but it should actually go just after the water because it's more polar than all the alcohols. The reason for this is that because on top of polarity, we also have to consider whether the solvent is protic or aprotic. Solvents that are protic have a labile H plus ion, either because they're acids or because they're hydrogen bond donors. Solvents that are hydrogen bond donors have at least one hydrogen that's attached to a much more electronegative atom, like nitrogen or oxygen. Examples of solvents like this are water and all of the alcohols that I used. These solvents can partially donate a hydrogen, which can help stabilize the negative charge on the oxygen of the A form. And between polarity and hydrogen bonding, they really tip the balance towards the A form. In the case of DMSO, it can't act as a hydrogen bond donor, and it relies only on its polarity. And because of this, even though it's technically more polar than the alcohols, it still can't stabilize the A form as well, and it gets shifted more towards violet. The acetic acid is just the extreme form of a protic solvent, where instead of just stabilizing and partially donating a hydrogen, it can just flat out give one away. So with the MOED, it just throws a proton onto the oxygen and kind of locks it in the A form. 
I think this overpowers almost any effect by polarity and just completely shifts it over to being yellow. As an extra little test, I dissolved more of the MOED in acetone and I added several drops of acid. And as I more or less expected, the violet color very quickly disappeared. So to sum this all up, the color of the MOED depends mostly on the polarity and whether or not the solvent is protic. When I first started this project, I thought that the color would correspond directly to a specific polarity, but that clearly wasn't the case here. This might be true for other sulfatochromic chemicals though, and I plan to explore this in future videos. Now before I go, this is just one last thing that I wanted to show, which I think is pretty cool. This is a photo of the solid MOED, and you can see that it's both red and blue at the same time. I think this is because as it crystallized, it did so in both the A and B form, which reflect light differently. Anyway, I think that's about it for this project. I honestly had a lot of fun messing around with the MOED, and in the future, I definitely want to try making some other solvatochromic chemicals. For now though, I think I've been doing way too much stuff with dyes, and I'm going to try something a little bit different for the next video. For the past couple months, I've been messing around with liquid rocket propellants, and I think I want to show you some of the stuff that I've found. I know I've been kind of slow with videos lately, and I'm not going to promise when this one will be released, but it should be within the next week or so. As usual, a big thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. Everyone who supports me can see my videos at least 24 hours before I post them to YouTube. Also, everyone on Patreon can directly message me, and if you support me with $5 or more, you'll get your name at the end like you see here.